Iowa's higher education institutions have weathered economic and pandemic challenges over the past year. We sit down with Iowa private college presidents Ann Harris of Grinnell and Daryl Colson of Wartburg on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Celebrating nearly 50 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa PBS. This is the Friday, August 20 edition of Iowa Press. Here is David Yepsen. In the world of higher education, challenges of enrollment, budgets, and staffing are regular topics. But the past 18 months of a global pandemic have increased pressure on colleges and universities to maintain standards and keep people safe. To discuss the future of Iowa's private colleges, we're joined by a pair of current presidents. Ann Harris is president at Grinnell College, and Daryl Colson is president at Wartburg College in Waverly. Welcome to you both. Thank you for being with us. And I want our viewers to know that uh, to accommodate schedules, we're taping this program on August 6th. But thank you for being here. Also joining across the table, Kay Henderson is news director at Radio Iowa. And Aaron Murphy is Des Moines Bureau Chief for Lee Enterprises. Ann Colson, I'll start with you. I'm sorry, <laughs> Ann, Ann Harris. Uh, Ann Harris. <laughs> um, as we tape this at the 1st of August, corporations have made decisions to require vaccinations among their employees. What plans are you making at Grinnell? Yes, we are so excited to welcome our students back. We missed them so much last year. So um, in anticipation of their arrival from 40 for countries and 48 states, we have decided to require vaccinations for our students. And they've been terrific. They've really led the way. Um, and we're ready to go this fall. What's the plan at Wartburg? We are um, working hard to encourage all of our students to get vaccinated as quickly as possible. We've had some success. And we actually are trying to approach this the way we approached the, uh, the whole academic year last year. We, uh, we instituted a program we called Knights Care. We were trying to um, persuade the students to engage our mission in a way that they took care of each other, took care of themselves and took care of each other. And so we're continuing that. What's exciting is that we have uh, actually student groups who have organized themselves, a public health ambassadors group, a, a faith in the vaccine group who've organized themselves and they're out, out there on Snapchat and other social media encouraging their fellow students. They're organizing vaccination clinics. And we'll have quite a few vaccination clinics on campus that have been planned and organized by our students at the very beginning of school. So that addresses, and, and Daryl, I'll start with you on this one. What is your level of concern with having students back on campus at a time when, again, as of early August when we recorded this, cases are increasing again. We've got the Delta variant out there spreading. I know the vaccinations, that's why they're so important. What is your level of concern with kind of the state of COVID right now, bringing kids back onto campus? Oh, well, I'd say we're, I'd say we're, we're, we're as concerned as, as we were toward the end of uh, the last academic year. We're very vigilant. So we have, a, <clears throat> we have a very complex and aggressive contact tracing program on campus. We have testing on campus through our NOAA clinic. And so we try the best we can to identify cases early on to do contact tracing, to quarantine students who uh, have been identified as being close contacts of somebody infected. And then we take really good care of the students who are in quarantine or isolation. We put them in some of our rental property and we take them meals and make sure that they have all that they need. So, so we will continue to be vigilant through the school year. As you know, even vaccinated people can become infected. And so it's rare, but it happens. And we'll continue to be really vigilant and take care of the students who, uh, who become ill. And same question to you. And I guess the requirement might ease your mind a little bit to that end. 
A little bit, yes. I mean, we're, you know, it's the same thing. You get to really know your campus, every nook and cranny of it, because you're thinking of spaces in such a different way when mm -hmm. you've got a highly contagious, you know, virus like, like we're, all, we're all dealing with. So uh, masking and thinking about spaces and contact tracing and um, that looking out for each other. You know, we were really happy to partner with the town of Grinnell in a Grin Well Together campaign is what we called it. Oh, um, cool. and it, was, it was really quite wonderful. And to, and to just think about looking out for each other because it really is, we call it public health, but it's community health as well. Mm -hmm. So all those precautions are in place. Well, moving past COVID, just to the larger question <laughs> of, uh, of private colleges, I'll ask Ann Harris, I'll start with you. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the condition of Iowa's private colleges? Yeah. Okay, that's a great question. The condition of Iowa's private colleges. I would say um, it is it is a, a network, um, and I would say a community of private colleges with a long history in the state, and I think a really beautiful tradition. It was part of what motivated me to move with my family here in 2019. Um, I think it, it holds a very special place. Um, those colleges hold a very special place in higher education, especially these small living and learning communities, which are so deeply connected to how we create community, society, democracy. So to me, they, they hold a very important place um, in our American society. And I would say they are networked and they are thriving, um, doing quite well. Darrell mm -hmm. Colson, what's the condition in Iowa of private education? The, one of the strengths of the, of the system, or the, the, the community, the network of private colleges, is that we're all very, very different. And I'd say we all, I said the condition, I mean, if I were to say, just answer the question in one word, I'd say the condition is good. And it's good because there's a high uh, regard for education in the state, uh, mm -hmm. like Ann. I came here 12 years ago partly because Iowa has such a terrific reputation. Not only are the, they're the uh, three fine state universities and then the fine community college system, but this, this community, this association, of private institutions is just wonderful. Our communities are very supportive. We're embedded. I'm embedded in, you know, my school is embedded in Waverly and it's very much a part of the community there. Mm -hmm. Hers is embedded in the community of Grinnell. They're just very much a part of the culture. So I'm, I feel really optimistic about the future of uh, these independent colleges. We hear concerns about uh, some of these universities having a hard time uh, attracting students. It's a competition for students generally. Uh, and it, uh, I guess it leads to the, qu and, and also a lot of emphasis less on liberal arts educations and more on science, technology, and education. Math. And Harris, uh, are, is Iowa's system of private colleges and universities overbuilt? Hmm. I think the you know, we, we, we need to see what happens really in the next 18 years when we've got a big change in American demographics and we, we know some, some of the birth rates have gone down and so forth. So we'll have to see and prepare um, for those changes that are coming over the next 18 years. I think they serve a really, really powerful purpose and students and families are still seeking that purpose. And I think mm -hmm. it is this idea of being these small campuses where when you live and learn together, you're active, you're leading, you're, you're creating community. So I, we still serve a purpose that is very much needed. Well, Colson, are they overbuilt for the mission they have? Is there a market mm. for uh, great books, courses? No. The, the, um, the, I mean, you, there's so many interesting things to say here. The, w one of the wonderful things about Iowa is that the taxpayers, the citizens of Iowa back in the 60s decided to support our system through the Iowa Tuition Grant, our, our network. Uh, enabling through the Iowa tuition grant, enabling uh, needy students to be able to choose the college or university they that would be best for them, right? So they could go to the University of Iowa if, they, if that was best for them. They could go to Grinnell, Wartburg if that was best for them. So what we've got in the state is a real uh, attitude of support uh, for the private institutions. Now, it is true that we're facing a demographic change. What The way many of us have responded is by trying to attract students from outside the state to come and join our Iowa students in school. That is good for our schools and it's good for the state of Iowa because a large percentage of those young people, once they graduate, will stay here and make their lives here. But, but, excuse me, one of the reasons that they created that tuition grant program mm -hmm. was they had a whole bunch of us baby boomers <laughs> coming into the market for higher education and they had to find a way to educate them. Mm -hmm. So they created the tuition grant program. Yeah, that's true. Well, <laughs> Now that the boomer uh, population is moving on, mm -hmm. does it make sense for Iowa to keep continuing with a tuition grant program for these private schools? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You, we, we. I mean, 
the principle behind it is absolutely golden. We want every high school student who graduates uh, from high school in Iowa to have a choice, and for that choice not to be restricted by their family's financial situation. So we want them to be able to choose a community college, a technical college, a university, or a small college like ours. Okay. Ann Harris, what happens to private colleges, four-year private colleges, if federal policymakers decide every high school student is entitled to two free years of a community college education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, and, and higher education has always shifted and changed. I mean, my father was went to um, college on the GI Bill, for example, and that mm -hmm. was a big moment in higher education of, of shifting and changing. So if it increases access to higher education, we'll adapt. And something like the program that you described would do exactly that. So I think we would think much more about transfer students, um, much more about bringing students in for those last two years of college and things like that. We, we'd want to partner with that federal system, with that federal plan. Mm -hmm. How has, um, Iowa has a good share of high schoolers who are already taking community college classes mm -hmm. um, and matriculating and mm -hmm. carrying those credits mm -hmm. into college. Um, how would you see having every high schooler have that opportunity mm -hmm. as opposed to the subset who are now having that opportunity impact Warburg? Well, I, I think I agree with Ann that if, if it's a matter of increasing access for high school kids to further their education, I think we'd be very supportive and we would figure out a way to adapt and to ease transfer uh, opportunities. I'll tell you just, just as a point of fact, our uh, large national association, NICU, uh, is very, I guess, encouraging, supportive of greater access. And what we've been advocating as an association, private institutions all across the country, is let's address this problem by doubling the size of the Pell Grant. And what that would do is not only would it enable every student in Iowa to go to community college for two years for free, but they could also make their own choice. So they could go to one of our schools, they could go to the University of Iowa. So that would be a wonderful opportunity, again, not only to support their education, but to enhance their choice. And so that's what we, that's, that, that would be our preference, but again, we're supportive of, of access. Let's talk about students who've already made a choice and they have college debt. Mm -hmm. What happens to um, institutions of higher learning in this country and specifically in Iowa if there is some erasing of student debt? What would happen to Warburg? Would that impact you at all? Um, I don't, it wouldn't impact us. It might impact some of our graduates, right? Some of our alum who, alums who are out there paying off their loans might realize a kind of a, a windfall if in fact the federal government decided to raise the, those loans. Those loans are owed to the U.S. government, right. not to Wartburg College. Correct. And Harris, good idea. The loan forgiveness, student, yeah, loan forgiveness, I think, and, you know, to launch students out of college and to so that they are able to really fulfill everything that their education has given them and to clear that barrier, yes. Wait, but you, you've heard the criticism. Mm. Uh, if you forgive the student loan debt, a lot of that is held by students who went to uh, expensive schools uh, like yours, mm -hmm. Harvard, uh, and that amounts to a subsidy to upper-class Americans. What do you say to that? So the, I think that's, that's a good point. I mean, there, you'd want to be sure and to devise a program that really benefits the students that need that removal of that barrier the very most. Um, I do think, of course, financial aid and the business models of private colleges are quite complicated, and it is really a partnership between families, the college, the federal government. It really all comes together. So I think we'd want to always focus on those who need the help the most. So, so so the reason that the student debt forgiveness and the two years of free tuition conversations have gained steam in recent years is because of the high the cost of college, the increasing cost of secondary college, mm -hmm. and that's for public as well as private universities. Uh, to each of you, Anne, we'll start with you. What is Grinnell College doing to make college more accessible and more mm -hmm. affordable to as many students as possible? This was probably... I would say maybe one of the most valuable lessons from the pandemic was noticing what was happening in terms of families in need and thinking about that long economic tale of the pandemic. So we were able to do a full analysis and realize that we could put together a no loan initiative. So loans are no longer a part of the financial aid packaging at Grinnell College. It is now possible to graduate from Grinnell without any debt. And that's really, we, we focused exactly on that as what we could do to contribute to that student success after college. Daryl Colson, how about Wartburg? What steps is the university taking to, to make college more accessible? 
We're, um, we're really proud of the kinds of financial aid programs we've been able to put into place. And so I'm, I, can, I can tell you with confidence that although, although it looks as though posted prices go up each year, um, we've been really successful at generating generous gifts from our, um, from our, our donors so that we've been managed to keep on average the cost that comes out of a student's pocket for tuition roughly the same in inflation adjusted dollars, roughly the same for about the last 15 years. It hasn't been easy, but it's required us to tighten our belts quite a bit, but it's also required uh, us to be generous with our financial aid packages, and I'm proud of that. A couple of months ago, we had as guests um, two leaders of community college systems in Iowa, and they both said that sports are sort of an entree for many students to their institutions. Mm. Sports require an expenditure of money, is it worth the expense at Wartburg to have sports as, a, as an outlet for some of your students? Well, absolutely. We, we view sports uh, uh, like other co-curricular activities, musical ensembles, student government, student media. Um, we view all of those as opportunities for students to engage and opportunities through which we're delivering on our mission. Our mission is to prepare students for lives of leadership and service in the communities they join. They learn valuable lessons about leadership and service, whether they're on the soccer team or they're uh, in the wind ensemble or they're the uh, editor, uh, sports editor on the uh, uh, student newspaper. So we think of those opportunities, I mean, not as, like, not as an expended chore that could be dispensed with. We think of that as part of the fuller education of the whole person. When people think of Iowa and Iowa State, they do think of football teams and basketball teams. Mm -hmm. When people think of Grinnell, they might not think of sports. <laughs> but what is the role of sports on your campus? Oh, it's, it's absolutely crucial. I absolutely agree with Daryl um, for the health and well-being of the students, for resilience as well, um, and for you know it's a very intense place when you're there living and learning together. You're taking all your courses, and so to me that balance that sports brings, and, and many of our students are involved actually in a couple of different sports and mm -hmm. so um, for us it's athletics and recreation they're connected and actually I'm looking forward to delving more into what that means especially in terms of resilience and well-being. Yeah. Des Moines Area Community College recently had a cyber attack mm -hmm. uh, that they were forced to deal with I'm curious to hear from each of you and Daryl mm -hmm. we'll start with you has Wartburg College had to up its cybersecurity game is this something that all colleges are concerned about these days? Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. All colleges, hospitals, yes. It's the same, it's the same story because we uh, have a, a lot of data uh, that, that belongs to our students and belongs to their families. And so we're constantly raising the bar of security on campus. It is, I'm sure you've found this in your workplaces, it can be frustrating, right, because we have to go through the, the, dual, the dual documentation and certification and the cell phone thing and the codes and all that. But yes, it's absolutely critical that we try our best to protect those data. Yeah. Yes, it's the same thing and there are those adjustments and it really is one of those moments where you realize we were all founded in the 19th century, we were far from the matting crowd, <laughs> we were an idol, you know, far from the world and it's a very permeable space. And mm -hmm. so we're coming to grips with that consistently, yeah. Mm -hmm. Without necessary. getting too technical, too into the weeds, what does that look like? What does what, what upgrading your systems look like to protect yourselves from things like that. So the dual um, authentication I think is probably the biggest adjustment that everyone has to make and then after that we prep all of our computers that our faculty and staff use and we have a we are deeply networked I would say um, and then there's just a vigilance there's a mm -hmm. vigilance to where are the, the passwords and the cracks and so forth so quite an so, effort. Um, the state universities um, argue that they have a role in Iowa's overall economy. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them have business parks attached to the university or research arms. What is Wartburg's role in Iowa? You mean, if you're thinking economically, we are um, an economic engine in Bremer County. Uh, we're one of the largest employers in the county. We probably generate about $100 million of, of economic activity, you know, when the economists do those sort of calculations about how many times dollars turn over and so forth and so on. So, um, so not only are we preparing young people to go out and contribute to Iowa's culture and economy, we're also at the very moment uh, doing that in our own community, hiring people, buying, buying products, bringing students who buy shoes in town. All, all those things are important. 
How many of your students stay in Iowa after graduation? We have about 65, this is kind of an interesting statistic, about 65% of our students come from Iowa to us, about 65% of our students remain in Iowa after they graduate, and it's not the same 65%. There's some overlap, but not the same. And so we're doing quite a bit to import uh, gifted, talented, and highly educated young people into the state. What's the view of Grinnell College? How does it fit or benefit Iowa's economy. Mm. I think I think that's the little told tale of small private colleges. Actually, is the economic impact. So, um, economic impact surveys I think are starting to happen. We need to refresh ours. But I know that when we did it, it was really striking the millions of dollars that come into the local economy mm. from yes, students, but also all the activities that a college will host. You know, whether it's conferences or, or, or events and so forth. So, I think that's that's definitely there in terms of um, those four years that. Every student is there, and then the alumni and their continuing contributions to the state of Iowa. That's true. Do you have statistics on the number of students who graduate from Grinnell who stay in Iowa? I don't have I don't have those um, ready at hand, but I don't think it's going to be the same numbers as Wartburg's, right? Because no. they they come from so many different places. Right. But I think that's absolutely I've seen this coming to Iowa and then staying here, um, and students from Iowa being the ones who leave. So there's mm -hmm. that that wonderful kind of transition that happens for our and students. And we hear a lot about that and the need to attract young people to Iowa. The, yes. the population growth has been stagnant here for a number of years now. What is, what is that from your standpoint, from where you, each of you sit, and how, how, how challenging is that, and how mm -hmm. can we attract and keep young people here? That's, a, that's in some ways the question, right? When we think about um, the intergenerational equity and the flow of what we're all trying to do here. Um, so to me, it's about what is possible here and making Grinnell College a place of possibilities, whether that's internships or research or classes or meeting people from all over the world. And I'm watching the state of Iowa do the same thing, some of the incubators, some of the entrepreneurship opportunities that are happening here. So we're part of the Greater Des Moines Partnership, which has been very exciting to be a part of. And I think that connection between higher education and business, higher education and, and politics is really important for that vibrancy that you're speaking of that, hey, I, I need to go there because things are possible there. Mm -hmm. Daryl, you're having some success, two thirds of your graduate what you're staying here what's what's the secret ingredient I think I think a lot of students when they when they they become involved in the community they uh, might participate in internships or community-based research they develop relationships and those relationships then can turn into contacts for job interviews after graduation isn't there some benefit we talk about economic development and keeping people here uh, but what about just having a liberal arts education what's the the commercial, if you will, for just having an educated group of citizens. Mm -hmm. Isn't there something to be said for that? Yes. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, Let's so hear much. It. <laughs> I mean, this to me is the core of why I do what I do and why I believe in education so much. I mean, one, one of the guiding, guiding quotes of my life is John Dewey in 1916 saying, democracy must be born with each generation and education is its midwife. Mm -hmm. Now, leaving aside that complex metaphor um, of <laughs> midwifery, um, it really does, it really does fulfill um, that incredible purpose of an informed citizenry and of students who have had four years with faculty and staff of of researching, of deliberating, of collaborating. These mm -hmm. are the fundamental practices of a democracy. I mean, there's there's one more, Danielle Allen is just this brilliant yeah. political scientist and she has said democracy depends on trustful talk between strangers. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's education. Mm -hmm. Joel Colson, same question to you, why liberal arts? Well, you can go back to the original definition. Liberal arts liberate people from prejudice, from, from ignorance. And so we're very much, you know, we're a Lutheran school, so we think a lot about liberation. We think of all, a lot about freeing people from the, bond, the bonds that bind them. And so when a student studies something that maybe uh, uh, he or she didn't know anything about in high school, uh, a philosophy course, a religion course, uh, a, so, a sociology course, they are learning so much that will, it may not be, it may not be the kind of thing that you think of normally as connected to a job, but what they're learning are ways in which they can interpret the world, ways in which they, they can relate to other people. Is it difficult, we just have a minute left, is it difficult to do that at a time when everybody is concerned about science and education and, and that job creation, but also when a higher education is under attack from a lot of quarters? Um, well, it, it, it's sometimes difficult to talk about it uh, in, in kind of the abstract, but when you start talking to students and to their families about the skills that they can build, 
when they're studying history or literature and the ways in which those skills can be powerful for them, whatever they do later on in life, giving them the capacity to, to develop coherent thoughts and to persuade people and to argue well and to deliberate well. That's that that's powerful stuff, and I think every parent wants every parent wants uh, uh, his or her child to be to have the, all the intellectual skills they can use to succeed in the world, whether it's a, you know democratically or in the workplace. Just a quick comment. I, the pandemic taught us more than ever. Scientists need philosophers. Philosophers need computer scientists. Computer scientists need historians. So yes, mm -hmm. more than ever. And I need to watch the clock. <laughs> we're, we're, thank you both for being with us. We're out of what time. What a pleasure. Thank you. What an thank honor. You. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thanks for your time. And we'll be back next week with another edition of Iowa Press at our regular times, 7.30 Friday night and noon on Sunday. For all of us here at Iowa PBS, I'm David Yepsen. And thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com.